here to tell his story. Please welcome to the stage the talented Patrick McCormick. Thank you, Marwan. Cool. So thanks so much for having me here this morning to talk about treasure. So it's nighttime, sometime in the mid 80s, somewhere in the Ottawa Valley, two boys are sitting on the roof of a farmhouse searching for treasure. What are they doing up there? Well, they've got this radio, and it's AM, FM band, but it also has shortwave on it. And it's a summer night, and they're tuning the frequency, searching for that treasure that's so meaningful to them. And it's tough, it's elusive. So as the elder of the boys gets closer to something, and it's like, oh, no, not that one, we gotta choose another one. So moving the dial, moving the dial. And finally gets there, and as the fine tuning comes in, you got it, that boom bap of that mid 80s hip hop, and that's what they found. And that's the first treasure hunt that I was on in my journey through hip hop. And from that point on, I was hooked. I was a fan, I was in. So that's a bit about the first treasure hunt. We're gonna talk about treasure today. We're gonna talk about uh, my journey through hip hop as a creative. Um, but a little bit about me before we get going. Um, I'm a soccer dad and husband. I'm a suburban civil servant. And I'm currently... <laughs> I am? <laughs> and I'm currently in the process of sort of offboarding a lot of my involvement in arts organizations. But we'll talk about all of that a little bit more as we go. So, the next treasure hunt, this one's really personal. So. I'm uh, so glad that I'm able to share this with you this morning. So a couple years later, still in that rural community, uh, you, somebody may have heard of Killaloo, Ontario. There's a beaver tail named after the space, and a lot of hippies occupy the space, and they used to grow a lot of pot up there. Uh, that's how I ended up there. I was a kid, I wasn't growing the pot, but there's correlations. Um, so I'm at school. You know, it's just a normal day so far. Uh, it's, I think it's morning. It's before lunch, and my mom shows up at school. And uh, she pulls me out of class, and my two siblings who are in the school are there as well, and my elder brother who was in the high school in an adjacent town is there. So we all load into this car, and I can see that there's some stuff packed in there. And this was unplanned, so I'm a little bit like, what's going on? Um, and there's a strange woman who I've never met who's driving the car. So we all pile in and we drive to Ottawa and still everything is silent, it's very mysterious. I don't know what's going on. So we end up in Ottawa and we're in Lower Town at a convent, a nunnery. And what happened was, was my mom was fleeing abuse. My father was abusive and she loaded in the kids and we went to this woman's shelter. And the hardest part about this specific treasure hunt was that when we got there, I was no longer treasure hunting with my brother. My brother was 16, had just turned 16, and at the time, in this women's shelter, a 16-year-old boy was considered a man, and he wasn't considered safe to be in the space. So he was put out uh, to go and stay in a men's shelter on his own, and my sisters, my mother, and I um, took up residence in the shelter. And it was at that time where, it was the first time in my life where I had my own room, that was maybe one of the only like <laughs> silver linings. Um, and I had a lot of time to myself. You know, I'd go to school, I'd come back. It's a pretty quiet place. So I started writing. I started writing poetry, and the poetry turned into rap. And that's when I found comfort and the ability to express myself, even if it was just like writing in a journal or a diary, to cope with those transitions in my life and that difficult time. And that's when my passion and my commitment to writing rhymes began. So, that was like, I guess that was around 88, I think. So, settling into life in Ottawa, you know, eventually we, you know, we leave the shelter, my mom finds a home for us, my brother's reunited, so 
Uh, you know, that was really nice. Um, but now I'm writing these raps and I'm kind of keeping them to myself, right? Anyone who knows me knows I'm a rap fan, but a lot of people didn't know that I was actually writing rhymes. So I'm going to Queen Elizabeth Public School in Ottawa's East End, and I'm walking to school every day. And um, at one point, I can't remember if it was a poster on a street post or if it was like a flyer on the ground or something, but I learned about this rap concert that was happening at Barrymore's Music Hall. And anyway, if you know Ottawa, you know Barrymore's, it's shut down now, it's, the building's kind of condemned, but at the time, that was like the spot, unless you're talking about the Civic Center or something, right? So. Um, I saw this, you know, there's a list of these different artists who were there, and I was like, I'm gonna go. And I didn't know, like, if my mother would approve of me going, so I didn't ask. <laughs> um, I got dressed as best I could, trying to style myself, you know, and I hopped out the window. And it, it was a bungalow, so it wasn't that daring. Um, Yeah, and then I got some change, and I jumped on the number two bus, and then I went down to Barrymore's, and I didn't get him. I was like 14 or 15. And uh, I was too young to get in the venue, but I hung out outside for at least an hour. And this specific treasure hunt was really amazing because I was literally sort of like being a detective in a way, right? I was out there on the sidewalk, watching people coming and going, listening to what they were talking about, watching their mannerisms, how they interacted with one another. And the biggest part was when the doors of the music hall would open and I could hear the music coming out. And it was at that time when it struck me like a ton of bricks. I was like, yes, there's rappers in Ottawa and they're in there on that big stage and all that dope ass music is coming out of the place. That was the point when I found my connection, not only to writing and to being a fan of the music, but knowing that I could be up there too. So I identified the community that I wanted to be a part of and my creative path forward from that point. And that's when a really strong passion for writing, performing, and integrating into that community began. So that was a, you know, a very significant treasure hunt along the way, thank you. Baby's beats in the kitchen. <laughs> so the creative journey continues. You know, I sparked that passion. I was um, in and out of a couple different rap groups, and then I settled into one called Boogaloo Tribe. And we did a lot in the city uh, over the years. And you know, I started rapping, but I also got into DJing. Then I got into making beats. You can see um, a famed MPC 2000 M uh, sampler drum machine sequencer right here. That one's not mine, it's a friend's, but um, I've still got a couple of them, <laughs> different versions of them. And so getting into that community and you know, participating as a creator, at this time I'm creating hip hop through all these different avenues, right? I'm creating the music aspect of hip hop. And um, I'm a student. So I get to this point in my life where I'm in Ottawa U and an unplanned pregnancy. I'm a father of twins, those are not my actual twins. Um, <laughs> but they were born eight weeks premature, they were very tiny, they stayed in the hospital, one of them for like three months in neonatal intensive care. She had heart surgery a week after she was born because she had like palpitations in her heart and holes between the cell walls and all this stuff, but they're young, healthy 23-year-olds right now, <laughs> both of them. So. This treasure hunt becomes a lot more literal in a sense. Um, there's the twins, there's myself, there's my partner and her son who's like under three, like two and a half at the time. And we're in this little sub-basement apartment in Jasmine Crescent. And um, I've got my beat making set up in the kitchen because that's where I could find space for it. And you know, I'm still trying to go to school and I'm trying to take care of these babies and be there for my family and still create, um, but you know, we needed money. So I was fortunate enough to be part of this community where I was selling beats sometimes for like 100 bucks, um, but shouts to Swap Studio and one of my mentors, Gogs, because at that time, I began brokering beats through Gogs, who um, ran this like successful rap studio in Ottawa. So he was selling my beats, taking his little percentage for brokering, and then sending money back to me. So at that time, the treasure hunt became a lot more literal because I was literally able to 
find sustenance, money to support my family through my creative endeavors. And that treasure hunt drove home another like really important thing along my creative journey. It was like, this isn't only a place to find um, a belonging, it's not only a place to find expression and solace, but it's also a place to find sustenance and I could actually find a career path, something that could contribute to my financial well-being and support my family through hip hop music. Um, and it came at a time when it was really, really needed. So that whole story, you know, oh, this kid, you know, he comes to Ottawa, he's living in a shelter. Oh, he's in the projects in the basement in Jasmine Crescent, if you know Jasmine Crescent, um, it's kind of Ottawa's version of the projects, I guess. Um, it's not unique to me. It's such a common story. Why is it that young people in difficult circumstances gravitate towards hip hop? It's because that's what hip hop was created for. Hip hop was born out of those circumstances. It was created by youth in an oppressive urban environment as a means to empower themselves and create a path for themselves forward. So there's a picture of uh, 1520 Sedgwick. That's credited as the birthplace of hip hop, and we're currently celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. So yeah, let's give it up for that, come on. So 50 years ago in the South Bronx, it was an extremely oppressive urban environment, and you had a lot of black and Latino kids in this environment where New York City is this rich place, everybody knows New York, but they're in the South Bronx and they're told you're nobody, you're not going anywhere, there's no space for you, there's no resources for you, you're gonna stay stuck here. And they were like, nah, no, we're gonna dance, we're gonna DJ, we're gonna make our graffiti art, and we're gonna get ourselves out of the circumstances. So you had the DJs putting the beats together, you had the B-girls and B-boys putting the dance down over the breaks, you had the MCs rocking the mic, and then you had the graffiti artists who were putting their name on trains, on subways, on billboards, and on the sides of the building, carving out space when they were told that they wouldn't have any space. So hip hop is innovative by nature, and it's a tool for youth to empower themselves. And we talk about hip hop a lot, we talk about those four elements, those artistic cornerstones of the culture, but there's a fifth element that's also so very important, and that's the knowledge element. And we have this mantra in hip hop, and it's up there on the screen, it's each one, teach one. And it's through that approach that I really started to get further integrated and developed not only as a hip hop artist, not only as a member of Ottawa's hip hop community, but as a human being. You know, I was kind of a wild young person for quite a long time, but there was always these points when people poured into me and impressed upon me knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and helped make me into the person I am today. So let's get back to the treasure hunting. At this point in time, we're gonna go back in time, maybe like a year. I'm in Ottawa U at the time, and I'm doing a third year communications paper on hip hop and the transmission of messages through the music. And I did primary research where I had people listen to Tupac and Biggie songs, and then uh, focus groups where we would uh, question them about what they understood from these songs. But I also did secondary research that took me to libraries. So I didn't find that much in the Ottawa U library, so I went over to Carleton. And I'm doing uh, you know, keyword searches in the computer system, and I find this one, I'm like, this is wild, this is interesting, okay. Social work through hip hop, a master's thesis by Stephen Leeflor. Hmm, cool. Oh, it's a video. So I end up in this, I think, if I remember correctly, I think I ended up in this little room with like a VHS player and this VHS tape, and I pop it in. And there's this, there's this guy, he's probably in his late 20s, he's got this beautiful flowing hair, he's a white guy, but he's got this particular cool swag to him, he's different, his own style. And Stephen Leeflor did his master's thesis uh, in social work on hip hop and social work. And it was so dope and I was so interested. And um, there was co correlations to the research I was doing for my paper, so I did cite him and I included him on paper. Then I went back to one of the OGs in my community who was taking me under uh, a rapper by the name Dragon Slayer, and he was familiar with this person. And he was like, yeah, yeah. So then at some point, I met Stephen Lee Floor, AKA Buddha, who is the co-founder of the Canadian Floor Masters, who are credited with really being one of the main forces for like installing and securing hip hop arts and culture in Ottawa. Canadian Floor Masters are currently celebrating their 40th anniversary, along with Ottawa's hip hop celebrating 40 years of anniversary. So 
it was at that time when that mantra of each one teach one really hit home for me because I realized that um, it wasn't a specific way that you could be mentored or mentor. It happens in hip hop sort of naturally as we bump into people who we can impart something into or learn something from. So I had the opportunity to meet Buddha and he eventually became you know, somewhat of a mentor to me who's still in my life today. Yeah, so as the creative journey goes on, right, we're uncovering all these treasures. I'm learning about hip hop, arts and culture, I'm learning about myself. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different ways to create, right? In the beginning, I just began as a fan, and then I started writing, and then I got into emceeing, performing, and then I got into like all the other aspects, making beats, DJing. Then I got into creating experiences, right? Curating shows, providing opportunities for people to connect to the culture through observation, through participation. And then I got into creating platforms. So I helped to launch the 411 Initiative for Change shortly out of uh, Ottawa U. Uh, that brought me to different cities in Canada, brought me mostly around the country, then it brought me to other parts of the world and expanded my horizons about what we could do with this culture. And um, then after that, I went on to found co-found CRB, which is Capital Rap Battles. And you know, it's interesting when we talk about these platforms, because it's like, oh, this is a great way for people to connect to arts experiences. Yes, for sure. But it goes deeper than that. And I'm not sure about other people's experiences through other types of arts and culture, but uh, here's a little story about CRB. Like one day, maybe uh, into like three years of operating that, um, that battle rap platform, one of the young men who's uh, engaged in the battles uh, takes me aside, you know, ahead of an event when we're just in the venue getting set up. And he tells me a little story about, he's like, yeah, man, I was into some really bad shit, man. I've been, been on and off like these bad drugs for like years. And then I, I heard about CRB and I came over to one of the battles and I jumped in, I did my last battle. And he's like, after that, I got clean because I wanted to be at a position where I could do the best possible battle. And I couldn't do that if I was still messing with these drugs. So for him, it was a f something to focus in his life, you know, something that he identified his passion with and that encouraged him to be a better version of himself. So just, just to give that anecdote that these are not just platforms, these are not just arts and entertainment, it's more than that for a lot of people. Um, shortly after that, um, you know, we went on to found the Cranium Arts Project and uh, co-founder Justin uh, J. Morris recently performed. And, you know, that platform was really meaningful because we created it knowing that it was needed, that there was not space for black, indigenous, and people of color artists in a culture and in art forms that were created by them. There wasn't a lot of resources, there wasn't a lot of space being provided to develop in the music, right? So we identified this opportunity, and it was interesting because a year later, right, the summer of 2020, George Floyd happened, and then everybody in the world started to see what we already lived for years and what we already experienced. And the music industry really grabbed onto that um, message as well in the arts industries. And then the platforms opened up to us. So then Cranium was able to really dig into that mandate a bit deeper, right, and move forward. So, the last step in that um, creative journey is creating change. So that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about um, in this next part of my journey. Um, my next treasure hunt, it's during COVID, it was after Cranium was created. Um, I found myself unemployed like a lot of people did during the pandemic and I needed a job. Uh, shouts to Sabra um, <laughs> because the Canada the Council for the Arts was hiring and I was like, okay, well, let me check this out and see what it's all about. I uh, wasn't the biggest fan because every time I applied for funding there, I was denied, uh, <laughs> literally. So um, I applied and then you know, I got past the first interview. Then before the second interview, they were like, yeah, we wanna invite you back for a second interview, but we wanna talk to you about our strategic plan and all this kind of stuff, so you should read it and we're gonna have some questions that relate to it and your fit. So I read it and it was dope. I was like, okay, st you know, systemic change, you know, okay, we want to advance society, we want to decolonize, we want to create space for people who've been marginalized. And I was like, okay, this is dope because this relates back to me. And this was one of the first times in my life, probably the first time where I was on a job search, but I wasn't desperate. 
right? Imagine when I was in the, in the kitchen with the beats and I just needed money. I had to support my family. My life was like that for decades, right? Just going through life, trying to just make it, you know what I mean? Keep things together. Finally, it was in a space where it's like, you know, I got a severance when I got laid off from my last job and it was COVID, so we weren't spending a lot of money traveling or anything like that. So I was interviewing them too. Right? But I found this synergy. The people who were interviewing me, I found a real sincere desire to create change in the arts. And I was like, this is a place where I can see myself because we need systemic change and it can't only happen from the outside, it has to happen from the inside too. So that tr last treasure hunt that I wanted to talk about was finding a new place to belong and a new place to bring my talents and represent for the hip hop community somewhere where we could always use stronger representation. There was representation and there is representation, but bring more because hip hop deserves it. So I could stand up here all day and talk about these treasure hunts that I've been on. There's a lot of interesting stories, some of them not really great for mixed company. But um, what I really want to do is, is I want to um, encourage you all to go out and go on your own treasure hunts. You know, we have that mantra, right, of each one teach one. And while that's coming from hip hop, it's not definitely exclusive at all to hip hop. Um, you can go out there and search for or offer whatever treasure it is that you have. And you can approach the world through that lens and always find something exciting, as whether it's you create a new relationship or whether you find some new information or you really impart something onto, into somebody who could really use that. So as you're you know, going through life, I encourage you to stay engaged, find your passion, bring it forward, cultivate it, develop your community, and you never know what kind of treasures you might find. Thanks a lot. Killed it, Patrick. That was wonderful. Thank you for taking us on your journey. I could take that. Don't go too far, though. We got some questions coming up. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you for being part of this community, from being a participant to being uh, an active uh, member, making space and, and creating opportunities for others. You're now that person that you looked up to when you were a kid. So it's beautiful to see, and beautiful to see what you're doing. I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, Something Patrick failed to mention, this isn't his beat maker because his is currently on display at the Ottawa Art Gallery. Uh, they're celebrating 40 years of hip hop. Yeah, give it up for, for that. They're celebrating the 40 years of hip hop with an um, uh, exhibition called 83 Till Infinity. So if you have the time, go check it out. It's full of gems. I know that there's people in here who have participated in it, who have their work in there too, so there's tons to learn there. Um, if you have a question for Patrick, well, that hand went up quick. Gabriella will be going around with the mic. Uh, so put up your hand and, uh, and we'll get to you. Hey, Pat. So uh, I was curious, you, when you first found your, you know, your vision, the wall hits you and all that kind of stuff, and you're like, boom, that's where I want to be, right? And then you got to here and you've named a bunch of things that happened to you to get you there. What were some of the really surprising things in, in, or people that showed up in your life that helped you get there? Thank you, uh, that's a great question. There's so many, there really is so many. Um, some of them are in this room right now. Um, you know, it never ends, right? Like that whole each one teach one and paying it backward and paying it forward, it just keeps going, you know? Shouts to Sabra, shouts to Savo, shouts to Kingsley, shouts to Jay Moore, shouts to David Pistol. Like it's, it's never ending. Um, you know, the part of the story where, you know, my mom fled my dad who was abusive, like my dad was a musician, right? And that's how my mom and my dad came together. And, you know, people grow and people change. And, I, and you know, the relationship was definitely broken for a long time between me and my dad, but um, it got better. And so he's also one of those people, right? And my mom is one of those people because when she saw, like, the passion that I had for this music, she supported it, you know? Um, you know, like parents of... Of friends, like I remember when I was in grade 12, um, I was dropping out of school. I wasn't officially dropped out. And then like it was just a, a friend's mom who was like, nah, you gotta go back to school, you know? Like, so, and then like there's another, you know? Um, Adrian Cadet is uh, 
like she's an OG of our community in hip hop and just general black community and just community in general in Ottawa. She's a teacher, she's an old school B-girl, and she is a change maker. And I remember um, when I was young and I was going to those like the hip hop shows and stuff in Ottawa and she was around and she would kind of pull me aside sometimes and be like, hey, behave, you know what I mean? I was, I was a bad kid for quite a while. Um, but then it was interesting because when I got hired at the House of Paint, um, one of the one of the mo things that stuck out, still stands in my memory the most is when Adrian came over to pay me a visit, and she took me aside and we went in the private room and we had a little talk and she was like, yeah, she's like, so you're here now, huh? Cool. So she's like, she's like, well, they told me they hired you. She's like, I just remember, and she said this. She used these words. She said, I remember when you were a young man running around pissing fire. And I paraphrase the rest, but those words stuck with me because she's like, you know, like, you know, people change and everything's destined to grow and you're here now and that's just amazing. And it was like people like her who, who saw something in me when I was young, even though I was tormented in a way, um, they also saw like the, the good in me and the value in me. And it was all of that pouring into me that got me to a position where I would be strong enough and level enough to pour into others and help build this community. Hey, Patrick. Um, you wear so many hats in the community and you've been uh, so active as well and whatnot. I'm wondering what you do for self-care for yourself. It's a great question and it's so relevant to my life right now, you wouldn't even know. Um, well, I'm, I'm off-boarding, right, that I mentioned. Like I've been doing too much and I'm getting older. I turned 46 three days ago. And I would say that I'm a person who's used to going, 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 and I just recently realized that it's destroying me. I can't do it anymore. It's destroying my relationships, and it's not good for my health. Um, but I pray. I meditate. I walk, and I actually started running again. Like, I had some injuries, so I wasn't able to run. And those kind of things really help me, right? Um, I live out in Barhaven, close to the river. There's a place called the Stonebridge Trail, and it takes me into nature, and I go there early in the morning, and I got this rock down by the river where the water flows very quickly, and there's that beautiful sound of birds and water flowing, and I sit there, and, and I meditate, and I pray sometimes, and I get the walks out. So that's one of the main things I do for self-care. Hey, Patrick. Um, what you said earlier, each one, teach one. Can you share some ways of how we can help each other thrive and grow together? Thank you. Um, there's so many ways. I think it's important that we don't try to confine or define too much how each one, teach one can work, but rather make it personal and make it mutual through whoever your pairing with. It could be an organization, it could just be, it could be an elder, it could be a younger, it doesn't really matter, um, but you'll know what your capacity is and where you have value to add. But it's also really important to think about identifying um, where you could use help and not being afraid to go out and say, hey, like, do, are you somebody who could like teach me about this or could impart this wisdom on me or maybe help me with this? So. Um, and then creating a methodology that works for your circumstances, right? Like Buddha, you know, sometimes we talk on the phone or it's like Facebook Messenger, <laughs> like whatever works, right? So um, I wouldn't say to make it too rigid, you know, make it work for whatever circumstances that are unique to you and bring your specific unique value to that situation. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just curious, how do you bridge your, the, the identity of you as an artist with you now working for an organization that uh, supports arts in a, I guess, in a, in a more bureaucratic kind of way? So I'm just curious as how you kind of bridge that those two identities. Yeah, thanks. Um, that was a big part of the dilemma of, of deciding if that was like the place for me. Um, 
But what's really interesting is like all this journey that I've been on, right, as an artist and an arts organizer and administrator in the community helps me really understand what the person on the other end of the phone or the person on the other side of the application process is going through and what their wants and needs are. And I can empathize and I can sort of like identify with them. So creating that change from the inside at the Canada Council, um, it allows me to really um, to kind of understand more, okay, like, yeah, this is bureaucratic, this is red tape. Um, I start to understand why some of those processes are there on the inside, but then I can also be like, okay, we have to find ways to smash some of these because they're not working for the community that we're supposed to serve. And it also helps me still like get, gather information from the community because a lot of the people in the community still identify with me. And even if they don't know who I am and I don't know who they are, like I speak their language so I can connect with them on that level. Hey, um, thanks for sharing all these wonderful stories, but I was really taken by, you know, that story of jumping out the window and trying to, to get in and find your space. And so many art spaces aren't accessible to, to youths, to, to teens, and we know the benefits of, of art spaces. So I'm curious if you've kind of taken that experience and what you've, how, how kind of creating all age spaces or how do we kind of connect with youth and, and you know kind of also this space right this is a great creative space but we rarely see kids here so like how do we really kind of start bridging those um, spaces as, and, and making and inviting and welcoming and letting youth kind of create in those spaces yeah it's tough um, great question and I don't know if I have like the answer I have some ideas um, I think House of Paint does a really good job of incorporating youth into their programming during the festival. Um, youth, like under the age of 18, it can be tricky when you have limited resources as well, right? Um, because you need to have certain things in place for their safety and their well-being in order to do that. So I think we have, as a society, right, we have to move forward and really understand like the value that we're providing to the young people and to ourselves, right, to building a better society by providing safe and nurturing spaces for young people. How we do that, that's tough, you know, because I, ha I've, I was in spaces as a youth that weren't safe, and I was there um, because I wanted to be there, but looking back, it's like, yeah, I shouldn't have been there. <laughs> you know what I mean, like nightclubs that got shot up and like, it was wild. Um, I had no business being there. Um, so going forward, I think it would be important that we as people in positions to sort of help create these spaces, just remember the value that these spaces provide to young people. And like, you know, the work that I was doing with Cranium, we were able to um, incorporate youth, but not like under the age of 18, right? So like we, we have this like, where does youth start, where does it end kind of thing, but there was definitely a priority on working with younger early career artists, but not necessarily teenagers. Yeah, that's kind of a non-answer, but that's what I got. <laughs> I've got a question. <coughs> can go there. Um, with the whole mantra of each one teach one, do you have a singular piece of advice that you learned from somebody that's really resonated with you and has taken you on this journey of life? Great question, Marwan. Yeah, Will Strickland, um, who was a mentor in my life at one point. I worked with him when I was uh, doing the 411 Initiative for Change school tours. He had this mantra, and it's really simple, but when I, I, it like stuck with me, so I'd keep going back to it. And Will Strickland would say, plan your work so you can work your plan. And that stuck with me because that's when I was making the transition in my life from being like a creator of art to a creator of experiences and platforms. And that necessitated a certain amount of structure, discipline, and longer term planning. And that really helped me get into a space where I was able to be this sort of person who helped create these platforms and create space for other artists and other creatives to get involved. Plan your work so you can work your plan. 
Thank you, Pat, for all of the work you've put out into the community. Um, I'm definitely one of those troublemakers that survived thanks to House of Paint over the years of volunteering there, um, which is coming up in the next two weeks, I believe. So definitely check it out. Um, and I would like to know, how do you bridge the gap between the urban arts and public service? Um, great question, and thanks. Um, House of Paint was really a great point in my life, too. It, it helped me develop as a human and as an arts administrator, planner. So shouts to House of Paint, for sure. Um, how do I bridge? Well, I think it's, it's the idea of being of service, right? to the hip hop community and to the community of marginalized artists in general, right? Having those experiences and live them and having the frustrations. Like I, I went into the Canada Council of the Arts with a bit of chip on my shoulder against the Canada Council for the Arts, right? But it gets to be focused and, it, and then it can be turned into energy for transformation. Right? So it's not just being there to be another cog in the wheel, it's to be a change maker, not a shit disturber, because like, the change is wanted. The methodology for change is where I get to shake things up a little bit, because the methodology is a little too complacent, in my opinion, in almost any bureaucracy. Right? And it's like we're in this period of rapid change in the world, and things are changing, and the people have demanded change. So are we just going to say, well, we have these processes that we have to follow that kind of prevent us from doing the change that we need? Why don't we change the processes then? Right? The processes should reflect the outcomes that we need. The processes need to enable where we're going. So I guess that's, I think that's an answer. <laughs> Oh, we got one back there. I guess this is something I like to ask, like I always want to ask everybody who speaks here. Like how do you, in terms of being a, an artist and a musician and all that, and being in Ottawa, do you ever feel like, oh, I should be in LA or New York or something? Or do you feel like you can fulfill your, your destiny and your potential in Ottawa? It's a great question. I mean, I'm not really creating music anymore. I'm thinking about getting back into it. I uh, bought a new sampler. <laughs> <laughs> haven't totally figured it out yet. Um, yeah, that's a great question and definitely felt stifled here for a while when I was really on my creative journey. And I sort of stopped creating for a while because I felt like I got to a point where I reached the ceiling in Ottawa. And unfortunately, um, I had at that time in my life some opportunities to do some stuff out of the country, but because I got in some trouble with the law, with some things related to marijuana, um, I couldn't leave, I couldn't go to the States, right? So I was kind of here, and um, I gave up creating for a while, um, but then I got back into it and I said, well, you know, I'm here, right? This is my home, and hip hop helped me integrate into this community and become a functional member of this community, so I'm gonna keep you know, creating platforms and opportunities for other young artists to be somebody and to, to follow their dreams and, and to ignite their passion. And that's really what, what a lot of the driving force behind creating these platforms in Ottawa was, knowing that there wasn't a lot of opportunity here um, so that I could, instead of identifying these problems and just sitting around and complaining about them, I could be the change. 